uh, I ask Kerala for this uh, another opportunity uh, so that uh, I can communicate with uh, all the students who are uh, going for the practical exam. So my talk on this uh, particularly ECG is mainly regarding uh, what are the ECGs that uh, uh, you know will be given uh, for the exam going students uh, in the practical exam and uh, what are the things they have to answer. It is not in detail about the ECG as such. So uh, actually before going in for uh, the what are the common ECGs that are kept for uh, the exam, some basics of ECG you should all know, always know. So let us talk about the some of the basics of ECG. Okay, so one thing is about the electrical conduction of the heart. You know, normally the SA node is there and you know AV node, the bundle of phase. So these are the ones, the pacemaker, uh, there are many pacemaker cells in majority of these conduction system, the atria and all. But you know, the SA node has got the highest intrinsic rhythmic activity of all the pacemaker cells in the heart. So it has got an intrinsic uh, rhythmic activity of nearly 100 to 120. That is the reason why it dominates over all other tissues as far as you know, uh, the pacemaker activity is concerned. So it is the one which produces the electrical activity, the initial electric, electrical activity. So once the SA node produces the impulse, so that impulse is conducted immediately uh, to both the atria and also to the AV node. So very rapidly it goes to both the atria and both the atria will be depolarized. The same impulse will come to the AV node, but at the AV node, so there is a delay. So deliberately there is a delay at the AV node and after the delay, the you know, impulse is conducted to the ventricles. Why this delay? You know that whenever the atria are depolarizing, the ventricles should be relaxing. So this is because you know when atria are contracting, that blood should enter into the relaxing ventricles. So that is why this delay is made by the AV node. And afterwards, there will be ventricular depolarization. So this sequential depolarization of the atria and then the ventricles is very important. And that is by the delay at the AV node. And this is in the ECG, you can see this as the PR interval. So this is another very important thing. So after that, the impulse goes to the bundle of his. Then it goes to the both the right bundle and the le left bundle. Left bundle, you have got the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle so that you know the impulse is transmitted to all of the ventricles and ventricle simultaneously both the right ventricle and the left ventricle will depolarize so when the ventricles are depolarizing the atria are relaxing and they are receiving blood the right atrium is receiving blood from the vena cava and the left atria is receiving blood from the pulmonary veins so this is how you see the electrical conduction of the heart this basic thing you should always know about now, one more common question I have seen many of the uh, you know examiners will be asking about because you know we have uh, bipolar limb leads, you have uh, augmented monopolar limb leads, and also we have the chest leads. So you know you will be knowing about uh, the bipolar limb leads and the augmented uh, monopolar limb leads. You know the uh, arm lead, right arm lead under under the right clavicle, left arm lead under the left clavicle, and then the foot electrodes will always be there. But most important for the exam purpose is the chest electrodes, where they are placed. So many of the students will not be able to answer this. So very important to know. So V1 is always placed on very close to the right border of the uh, sternum on the fourth intercostal space. V2, the same position, but very close to the left border of the sternum, that is at the fourth intercostal space. V3 is in between the V2 and V4. V4 is in the fifth intercostal space, the mid-clavicular line, V5 at the anterior axillary line and V6 the mid axillary line. So because of these various positions, when you record the ECG, so the you know the morphology of these QRS complexes also will vary. I'll also tell you about that also. Now other basic thing about the ECG is you know these are very common questions that are asked in the exam, so you should be able to answer. So what is the speed of uh, the paper on which the ECG is being taken? So the speed of the paper is always at 25 millimeters per second. So this is another very important thing. So what do we mean by 25 millimeter per second? That means, you know, the, it's going at a speed of 25 millimeter per second. That means for one millimeter, so it will be about 0 0.04 seconds. Because, you know, you have on the ECG paper, 
you have the small boxes and you know the large boxes each small box horizontally it is the one which actually records the time so horizontally 1 mm is 0.04 seconds and you know five uh, small boxes will make a large box so you know the large box will have a time of 0.2 seconds so this is very important to know and again vertically you have the voltage so vertically 1 mm of this paper will have about 0.1 millivolts that means small box is 0.1 millivolt so large box will be 0.5 millivolts so this is the basics about the ecg paper and how it is recorded now another very important thing you should also know is regarding the standardization so this is one more thing many times many of the examiners will be asking how the you know what is this standardization because you know invariably with any uh, ecg graph so the, it will be there either in the beginning of uh, the ecg um, uh, graph or at the end of the ecg graph it will always be there so look at this this is the uh, you know the standardization curve so how it should be standardization curve so one thing is regarding the voltage of the standardization curve so the voltage should always be 1 millivolt we know that each small uh, square that is 1 mm vertical it is 0.1 millivolt so it should be about 10 mm so 10 mm if it is there if you look at this so if it is there 10 mm you know that this it is properly standardized to 1 millivolt this is again important because suppose if uh, the standardization curve is uh, done for you know 0.5 millivolts so if it is done for 0.5 millivolt if you have not observed this so all the ecg uh, you know the voltage of all the you know uh, the pqrst uh, everything the waveform will be you know very much decreased so that is why this you know voltage is very very important so one has to look for this so uh 10 small squares point 1 each small square so 1 millivolt so another thing is shape of the standardization curve so it should always be of a square wave pattern so with this we know that the stylus of the ecg machine that is touching the ecg paper it is not properly is placed on the ecg paper suppose if the stylus is very lightly placed on the ecg paper that effect what we call it as under damping and if you can look at the this particular standardization curve you can hear an over uh, or upstroke here so this upstroke will tell us that you know the the stylus is uh, you know lightly touching the paper so if uh, because of this there is a overshooting so what happens is you know there can be you know spuriously increased amplitude all of all the waveforms when the stylus is touching lightly this is called as under damping effect the other thing is the over damping effect suppose if you see the uh, this particular uh, standardization curve and if it is like a sine wave that means the stylus is touching too much onto the ecg paper so what will happen is the voltage of all the uh, waveforms will be decreased so this is one thing always look at this sometimes when you are uh, being given in the ecg suddenly they will ask you about the standardization so better to know about the standardization so coming to the the different waves that are there so all these things you'll have to go systematically once you go systematically you will not miss anything so the you know the first is the p wave the p wave is always an upright uh, p wave and p wave we know that it represents the atrial depolarization always look for in any ecg that has been given whether the p wave is present or absent so or suppose if it is present whether it is normal or abnormal the third thing is If the P wave is present, it is coming before the QRS complex, or it is coming after the QRS complex. So these are some of the very important things about the P wave. So what are the abnormalities of the P wave? We can see, you know, in right atrial enlargement because you know P wave represents the atrial depolarization. That's what I just told you about. So in right atrial depolarization, what otherwise it is also called as P pulmonal. What happens is the P wave voltage. increases so that means the amplitude of the p wave will be more than vertical 3 mm so that is because of the right atrial enlargement so, so suppose there is a left atrial enlargement what will happen is because the left atrial enlargement means the impulse that is generated in the sa node will depolarize the right atrium first and then otherwise simultaneously it would have uh, depolarized the left atrium also but here uh, if uh, there is a left atrial enlargement Uh, uh, especially in case of mitral 
uh, stenosis. So then it will take a longer time to read the left atrium. Because it is taking a longer time to read the left atrium, so there will be a widening of the P wave. So normally the P wave uh, width is less than 0 0.08 to, it is normally is 0.08 to 0 0.12 seconds. So when it goes beyond three small squares horizontally, more than 0 0.12 seconds, then we say that there is a prolonged P wave and usually it occurs in case of mitral stenosis as a result of left atrial enlargement. And you know, this is also called as P mitral wave. So in case of pulmonary problem, the right atrium can be enlarged. So that is produces a P pulmonate. And in uh, mitral stenosis, the enlargement of the left atrium, it will be bifid and the second peak will be tall and also broad. And this is called as a P mitral. Suppose that there is both left atrial enlargement and the right atrial enlargement, like that in occurs in uh, case of mitral stenosis only, uh, after a chronic mitral stenosis, then you know I told you that only left atrial enlargement is there when the P wave is bifid. The second peak is taller, but when both atria are enlarged, so both the peaks are of the same size. So that's about some of the things you should always observe whenever you are observing the P wave. Next is the PR interval. I was telling you when I was uh, talking to you about there is a delay at the AV node uh, for the impulse, and that delay is the one which produces this PR interval. Now, because you know now the P wave represents the atrial depolarization, now the QRS represents the ventricular depolarization. So there has to be a delay between this and uh, the atrial depolarization and ventricular depolarization, and that is what we call it as a PR interval. So normal PR interval is 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. So if this is increased, so that means there is more delay at the AV node that you call it as first degree AV block. So that means the, um, the PR interval is more than 0.2 seconds. There are so many causes. It can be because of the degenerative changes that occur in the AV node because of maybe ischemic heart disease itself or old age, or it can be due to digitalis toxicity also it can occur. It can be due to hyperkalemia also. So you always look for the PR interval after seeing the P wave. So another thing also, the PR interval can be shortened also because I was telling you about the PR interval. It is 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. Suppose what is why, why, when a you know, PR interval can be decreased if it is less than 0.12. So it occurs in pre-excitation syndromes, especially like you know Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. Levan Garang Levin syndrome. Here, what is the problem is there is an accessory pathway directly communicating the SA node to the ventricles. So this accessory pathway will bypass the AV node. Because it is bypassing the AV node, as soon as the stimulus starts from the AV node, directly the electrical activity will reach the ventricles and start stimulating the ventricles. So because of that, you know, in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, there is a direct communication between the SA node and the ventricles. So that is the reason. So a pre-excitation of the ventricles will produce an aberrant wave that is called as a delta wave, which I'll be discussing later. So whereas in LGL syndrome, there is only a short PR interval because you know the SA node, the aberrant, the aberrant pathway is connecting SA node to the uh, you know bundle of this. So that's how you know, just bypasses the AV node. Then the QRS complex is not wide. There, there is no delta hump there. So the other thing now coming to is the Q wave. So normally you may have a very small Q wave or Q waves may not be visible at all. So when we say it is a pathological Q wave or a significant Q wave. So width of the Q wave is very important. If the width of the Q wave is more than one millimeter and also the depth of the Q wave is more than 25% of the succeeding R wave, we call it as a pathological Q wave. And this pathological Q wave, if there is associated STT wave changes like ST elevation at all, it represents an acute transmural infarction. Suppose there are no ST T wave changes, there are no active uh, problem for the patient, and you only have a pathological Q wave, it represents an old infarction. So this is again very important. So you are going systematically uh, from P wave, PR interval, now you have come to Q wave. Now coming to the QRS, um, uh, the wave. So the QRS, I told you that it represents the ventricular depolarization. So in QRS, you look for the width of the QRS and also the amplitude of QRS. 
now the width of the qrs normally it is 0.08 to 0.12 seconds so if it is more than 0.12 seconds then we call it as a widened qrs complex so you know that is also again important the widening of uh, the qrs so widened qrs complex usually can be there in bundle branch blocks so especially whenever there is a rbpb lbpb where you know one of the bundles is blocked so it is taking a longer time to depolarize the ventricle that's how because of the longer time the qrs gets widened it also will be widened in case of premature ventricular contraction it can also be widened especially in um, you know cardiomyopathies and also can be widened uh, will be widened in ventricular tachycardia and you know whether it is uh, monomorphic or a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that's about the the width of the qrs so always look for the width of the qrs whether it is less than 0.12 or more than 0.12 then again the amplitude of the qrs is very very important to diagnose the hypertrophy of the ventricles whether the right ventricular hypertrophy or the left ventricular hypertrophy will come to that later now coming to the uh, you know st complex and also the t wave so the st segment is you know the you know the j point is also very important where the descending s meets the st segment is called as the j point so you will have to look for any j point elevation is there or not j point depression is there or not it is mainly uh, for knowing any ischemias are there or you know here you can see in one of the um, uh, graphs i have uh, shown here so st is j point is elevated and there is no convexity it's a concavity it can be early repolarization or you know the st can be sagging and t wave can be inverted it can um, it can uh, you know denotes it can be an ischemia or just st may be sagging that can also show with uh, probably uh, you know uh, the uh, ventricular hypertrophy that shows that there is a strain on the ventricles and you know the other thing is the qt interval so qt interval is from the beginning of the q wave to the end of t wave so this is again very very important so this usually is 0.36 to 0.42 seconds so it can be prolonged in some individuals so whenever you are uh, looking at the ecg and you are trying to identify the problems always measure the qt interval and it has to be corrected for the rate and that is called as qtc interval so how do we correct you measure the qt and divide it by square root of rr interval so when you because you know qt can get prolonged in bradycardia qt can be shortened in tachycardia so you have to correct this qt for you know the rate so once you correct it for the rate if it is more than 0.42 then you can say prolonged qt interval and especially these patients with prolonged qt interval they can have problems under anesthesia many times they, even with one set run they can have a torsion dist points point is so many other drugs can produce in these patients with prolonged qt interval the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that is you know torsion dist point is so these are the basic things you should always see here uh, before we go in for the further things about the you know the waves different waves of the ecg and their intervals now coming to some of the changes i was telling you about the electrodes so uh, you know because of the position of the electrodes you can have you know the configuration of these qrs complexes are slightly different so you should think that these are the normal things because of the presence of the position of the electrodes like you know in lead to always you are you have an upright p wave you have an upright qrs complex normally in avr you know the opposite because you know in uh, lead to the electrical impulse is going towards the electrode that is being uh, you know recorded so what hap what happens is when the electrical activity is moving away from the electrode you have negative deflection and whenever the electrical activity is going towards the electrode you will have positive deflection so now in avr you know the electrode is on the right upper limb so the electricity of the heart is moving away that is why all the waves you will have a negative deflection so that's why p wave will be uh, negative the qrs complex also will be having a negative including the p wave whereas in v1 you know there is a small positive deflection and also as far as the qrs is concerned a small r wave and a deep s wave will be there so why this in v1 is because 
you know normally when the impulse enters into the septum so uh, that is uh, through the bundle of phase and then it goes through the right bundle and also left bundle simultaneously so from the right bundle the right ventricle is depolarized you know that means the our v1 electrode is on to the right of the right ventricle that is because that's what initially i told you the v1 electrode is at the fourth intercostal space very close to the right border of the sternum so when the impulse starts moving and then start depolarizing the right ventricle right ventricle being very thin wall so you have a small r wave in the meantime what is happening is the impulse is also moving away from the v1 electrode because it is trying to depolarize a very thick um, the left ventricle that is why because the impulse is moving away so you have you have a deep s wave and a small r wave in v1 so whereas in v6 because you know the initially the impulse is moving towards the right ventricle you may have a small q wave and afterwards because the impulse is moving towards the left ventricle you have a you know positive r wave so this is some of the differences in different uh, leads because of their position of the electrodes you should always know about now coming to the rhythm as soon as you see the ecg you should always recognize whether it is rhythm is regular or irregular this is very important because before you go for calculating the heart rate you should know about the rhythm because if it is rhythm is regular you just have to see what are the number of uh, boxes between the rr uh, rr and then you can definitely calculate the heart rate because if the rhythm is regularly regular or irregularly regular so because then the rr interval keeps on varying so you will not be able to calculate the heart rate but by just calculating and small boxes or large boxes between uh, a few of the r r waves so then in such situation you have to know what is the period of recording of that particular ecg and based on that suppose if it has been that particular uh, graph has been recorded for 6 seconds you just see how many r waves are there in that or qrs complexes are there in that 6 seconds so now you have to extrapolate it to 60 seconds that is you multiply by 10 so you can get the the heart rate so whenever there is rhythm is irregular the heart rate is calculated like that but if the rhythm is regular the heart rate is usually calculated based on the rr interval you just see what is how many are the small boxes between the rr so now you have to divide 1500 by uh, 1500 has to be divided by the number of small boxes between the rr because you know why 1500 this is again another exam question sometimes we will be asking why this number is because now each small square is 0.04 seconds so if you have 1500 small squares then only it will make 1 minute because the heart rate we always calculate for 1 minute so 1500 number has to be divided by the number of small squares suppose you want to just check how many large squares are there Uh, in between the rr and you want to calculate the heart rate then the number is 300 because each large square or large box is 0.2 seconds so 300 large uh, boxes will make 1 minute 60 seconds so that's why this 300 number so after knowing the rhythm and if the rhythm is regular you calculate the heart rate like this if the rhythm is irregular already i told you just see what is the duration of that particular the recording of that particular uh, you know lead of uh, that ecg and if it is about 10 seconds or 6 seconds so extrapolate it to the number of r waves in that and extrapolate it to 1 minute so now for practical examination what are the ecgs that are usually kept so usually the ecgs that are kept are dysrhythmia ecgs because you know the most common intraoperative or uh, perioperative dysrhythmias whatever that occurs that are very important for us as anesthesiologists so some of these tachyarrhythmias uh, ecgs can be kept like sinus tachycardia supraventricular tachycardia atrial flutter atrial fibrillation junctional tachycardia vt ventricular tachycardia ventricular fibrillation apcs and vpcs so bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias you know sinus bradycardia um, atrial ventricular um, um, sorry av nodal blocks and the bundle branch blocks rbpb and lbpb also some of the ecgs regarding myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction and also you the the ecgs regarding the electrolyte imbalances can be kept for you for the practical exam so we'll discuss about all these 
ECGs that are kept for, that usually will be kept for your practical exam. So before going in this for the tachyarrhythmias and gliarrhythmias, one of the common, common arrhythmia that uh, many of the patients can uh, usually have is the sinus arrhythmia. So what is this sinus arrhythmia here? You know, all the impulse is always generated by the SA node and SA node, the P wave is always followed by the QRS complex. So the relationship between the P wave and the QRS complex and the STT wave will not change in uh, these complexes. But what is very important in sinus arrhythmia is you know, change in the rate in relation to respiration. That is what is called as sinus arrhythmia. Because during inspiration, the RR interval will come down, the heart rate will increase. So during expiration, uh, the RR interval will get prolonged and there can be a decrease in the rate. So this you know, change in the rate, increase in the rate of the uh, heart rate during inspiration and decrease during expiration is called as sinus arrhythmia. And this is mainly because of the parasympathetic influence on the heart and also on the, the pacemakers and the conduction system of the heart. So this is very important for us to know and also very important to diagnose if this kind of an ECG is given to you in the, for the exam, so sinus arrhythmia. So this is very common in children. Uh, you, know, you know, in children, there is a parasympathetic dominance and for anesthetic importance is very important here, especially if an young adult comes and an ECG has been recorded and you see the sinus arrhythmia in such an um, adult patient. So you have to think that this patient will have a high parasympathetic influence on his heart. That means because of this parasympathetic dominance, what will happen is when you give a spinal anesthesia in this patient, now spinal anesthesia will produce a sudden sympathetic block. So there will be, you know, unopposed parasympathetic influence on the heart and there can be suddenly the patient can go for severe pedicardia and also the arrest can occur. So any patient, young patient, posted for spinal anesthesia with sinus arrhythmia, you have to be extremely careful. This is what you are expected to talk in the exam also. Now, what are the common causes of intraop arrhythmias? This again uh, will be asked you. If there are some common causes are there for intraop arrhythmias. Like the most common cause is lighter plane of anesthesia. If you just say for any arrhythmia, intraop arrhythmia, if you just say it is lighter plane of anesthesia, you're always correct. So then, you know, the other things are hypoxia, hypercarbia, hypocarbia. Hypocarbia is very important that can be hydrogenic because if you try to hyperventilate, you can produce hypocarbia that can initiate dysrhythmias because that can reduce the potassium uh, in the extracellular compartment. So pre-existing cardiac diseases is another very important cause for intraop dysrhythmias. Then endocrine causes like pheochromocytoma, heterotoxicosis, Macon syndrome. So these, uh, that is primary um, hypoadrenal um, um, functioning, all these can produce, uh, you know, intraop arrhythmias, endocrine causes, electrolyte imbalance. We know that, uh, you know, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, all these can produce dysrhythmias and finally the drugs. And especially our anesthetic drugs, we know that, you know, certain drugs like succinylcholine can produce halothane are notorious to produce intraop arrhythmia. So just remember about the common causes of perioperative arrhythmias. Coming to the tachyarrhythmias, so the most common uh, ECG that can be given to you is the sinus tachycardia. So in sinus tachycardia, you know that uh, the rate is high. Normally, you know that the rate is about 60 to 80. So any patient, adult patient with a rate of above 100, but usually less than 150, you consider the patient to have sinus tachycardia. So here, now the P wave will be present, QRS will be present, the PR interval will be normal. So the P wave uh, relationship to QRS is also normal. So everything is normal except the rate. So what are the causes for sinus tachycardia? So they, there can be many causes for uh, sinus tachycardia. And you know, if the sinus tachycardia occurs in patients with ischemic heart disease, mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, or obstructive cardiomyopathy, it can be dangerous also because in IHD, if there is a tachycardia, you know that uh, it is during the diastolic period that the left ventricle will be getting the blood. So if there is um, tachycardia, the diastolic period is decreased, so supply will decrease. The demand may increase because of the increase in heart rate. So the patient can immediately go for an myocardial ischemia. And you know MS, because the diastolic period is so important in MS, 
because the left atrium can empty its uh, contents only if the diastolic period is prolonged. If there is tachycardia, immediately the patient can go in for pulmonary edema also. So what are the causes for this? It can be just physiologic. So just excitement, exertion, pregnancy, pain, fever. And the most common cause under uh, anesthesia is lighter planes, as I said. Many of the drugs can produce intraoperative uh, tachycardia, like anticholinergic drugs, sympathomimetic drugs, and also some of the anesthetic drugs, like ketamine, pancuronium, ether, cyclopropane. These are some of the drugs which can produce you know, intraop uh, tachycardia, hypotension. Again, Mary's reflex, you know, that whenever there is hypotension, the heart rate will increase. Then hyperthyroidism, definitely, again, pheochromocytoma, um, definitely can produce sinus tachycardia. So if there is sinus tachycardia, usually you try to treat the cause. But in a patient where you don't ex want the sinus tachycardia, even um, um, uh, uh, increase in the rate can definitely can produce a lot of problems, especially in ischemic heart disease and mitral stenotic patients. So in such patients, better to treat it. So though you have treated all the causes, sometimes there can be an unexplained sinus tachycardia. So always treat with beta blockers. So most commonly used beta blockers can be SMOLA. So another thing is an SVT. So this is another um, tachycardia, commonly kept uh, ECG for you in uh, the exam. So SVT, you know, the rate is more than the sinus tachycardia. Usually the rate will be above 150 and it can be as high as 250. The rhythm will be usually regular and, you know, the P waves may not be able to differentiate because the P wave may get merged with the uh, QRS complexes because of the fast heart rate. The QRS is invariably narrow unless there is an aberrant conduction like associated with RBBB or LBBB. So supraventricular tachycardia definitely requires treatment. So if always, whenever there is any arrhythmia, even in the exam, you always say that I like to see the you know, cardiovascular status of the patient. If the status is you know uh, stable, then you have time to manage these tachycardias. So definitely you can go for vagal maneuvers the carotid sinus massage is the most commonly used vagal maneuver. If you say carotid sinus massage, you will be asked about a so few things about the carotid sinus massage, where it is given, how long you have to give. Can we give the carotid sinus massage on both sides simultaneously? These are the, some of the questions you can be asked about when you say about carotid sinus massage. Then the drug of choice is adenosine. And you know, if you are using a peripheral vein, Adenosine is usually given six milligrams IV stat, and it has to be given rapidly. Only two drugs in anesthesia which have to be given rapidly are, you know, one is adenosine, another is succinylcholine because they rapidly get metabolized inside the plasma itself. So six milligram IV adenosine you give and, uh, you know, uh, flush it with about 15 ml of saline. So if the sinus tachycardia comes back to sinus rhythm, fine. If it does not come back to sinus rhythm, then you have to repeat it with 12 milligrams. So if you are using a central vein, then you can reduce the adenosine dose by half. The problem with adenosine, you should always remember when you give it, it can produce bronchospasm because it produces bronchoconstriction. So it is very important to keep that in mind. And also in the exam, you may have to answer that. Suppose you have given adenosine also, and uh, you know still uh, the rhythm has not reverted to normal uh, sinus rhythm, and also the patient is having a cardiovascular compromise, then it is better to cardio out the patient. So you can use uh, 50 joules of the current with a biphasic uh, defibrillator and cardio out the patient. Now coming to the next uh, you know, common uh, ECG that is kept is the atrial flutter. So atrial flutter is again, you know, you can easily diagnose atrial flutter. You can, instead of P waves will be absent here. Instead of P waves, you can see the flutter waves. That is, you know, the capital F waves, or they look like sawtooth appearance. So when you have a flutter, many times the, um, the, the rhythm can be regular. So very rarely, so if there is, you know, change varying uh, the block across the AV node, then you can also have a irregularly irregular heart rate also. So whatever the atrial flutter is there, the causes for atrial flutter and fibrillation are same. And also, the flutter can anytime go into fibrillation. The management of atrial flutter is also same like atrial fibrillation. So once you identify, so we also will discuss about the atrial fibrillation because 
the causes and management of flutter and fibrillation are almost same. So coming to the atrial fibrillation, so how do you diagnose atrial fibrillation when an ECG is given? So there is absence of P waves, P waves may not be there. It's fine fibrillatory waves, you may not be able to recognize. So absent P waves with irregularly placed narrow QRS complexes is the answer for diagnosing atrial fibrillation. So absent P waves with irregularly placed narrow QRS complexes unless there is an aberrant conduction in the ventricle is the atrial fibrillation. So what are the how? <coughs> so what are the causes for atrial fibrillation? So rate can be very rapid. It can be 150 to 250. So the most common cause based on the more commonly that can occur this atrial fibrillation with that particular condition is the mitral stenosis is the most common cause of atrial fibrillation. Many of your patients uh, with mitral stenosis may also have atrial fibrillation. So the other the second thing is the hyperthyroidism, then chronic hypertension, and especially geriatric patients may have the uh, you know, atrial fibrillation. Intraoperatively also, they are more commonly to develop atrial fibrillation and the collagen disorders. So it's very important to manage this, uh, suppose the perioperative atrial fibrillation that occurs. Because you know, uh, in a patient with mitral stenosis, if an atrial fibrillation occurs, that means the atria are not properly contracting at all. So the atrial contribution to ventricular filling is very important in mitral stenosis. Almost you know, 30 to 40% of the cardiac output is contributed by the atrial depolarization and the atrial contraction. Suddenly, if the patient intraoperatively develops an atrial fibrillation, this amount of cardiac output is not there for the patient. And this amount of blood, which should have entered into the left ventricle, now stays back in the left atrium, and that immediately produces a sudden increase in the LAP, so the patient can develop a pulmonary edema. The same thing again with old age people, because in the old age, the atrial contribution to ventricular filling is again very important, because you know in the old age, the compliance of the left ventricle uh, decreases, so ventricular relaxation is not much, so these patients will have a diastolic dysfunction, so atrial contribution is very important to their filling so of the ventricle. Suppose if suddenly if they do develop atrial fibrillation intraoperatively, their cardiac output will suddenly will decrease and they can go for severe hypotension. So that's why in these situations, it is very important to treat the atrial fibrillation immediately. So again, management, I told you that you should never be trigger happy. So always see the cardiovascular stability. If the cardiovascular stability is there, that means hemodynamically the patient is stable, you can go for pharmacological treatment. As far as pharmacological treatment for atrial fibrillation is concerned, you have to go for either rate control or rhythm control. So the rate control is, you know, you prolong the AV conduction. So by prolonging the AV conduction, all the, you know, uh, the stimuli that are occurring in the atrium, that is, it can be as long, as much as 300 to 400 impulses that are originating in the atrium. So once you prolong it and produce more blocks at the AV node, automatically the ventricular um, rate will come down. That is what, what is called as the rate control. So another thing is the rhythm control. That means you revert the atrial fibrillation to sinus rhythm. So pharmacological treatment for rate control, you can use majority of the times the beta blockers are commonly used. You can use esmolol or metoprolol, or you can go for calcium channel blockers like DLTSM or verapamil, or also you can um, you know, go for um, the drugs like digoxin, which is usually orally digoxin is very commonly used for atrial fibrillation in India because it is one of the very cost effective drugs. So usually, perioperatively, we, nowadays we are not using digoxin because we are having better drugs. So suppose the, you don't want to go for rate control, if you want to go for rhythm control, then pharmacological rhythm control is by amiodarone. So suppose if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, it is always better to go for cardioversion. So cardioversion is by using 100 joules of the current and using biphasic defibrillator. So one more thing, when you are given an atrial fibrillation uh, um, uh, ECG during your exam, so you are also asked any other drug the patient will be on if the patient is having chronic atrial fibrillation. So invariably, the, these patients, especially with uh, 
chronic atrial fibrillation will be on anticoagulants so when they require anticoagulants is you always go go with the one of the scoring pattern is called as charts was scoring so what is this charts was scoring so c uh, represents congestive heart failure h is for hypertension a is age more than 75 years because i told you it's very common in old age so if the patient has got age more than 75 years two points are given if the patient has got diabetes mellitus one point and if the patient also has a stroke or a taa two points are given then the was is recently added to this chart score was is you know the patient has got a peripheral vascular disease one point age less than 75 but more than 65 again one point and sex of the patient again you know uh, the female sex so these are the points are scored and the point is you know either one point the patient scores are zero point there is no requirement of anticoagulants for the patient if the patient scores three and above it is high risk for developing pulmonary uh, pulmonary or you know uh, cerebrovascular uh, thromboembolism so these patients are invariably put on anticoagulants therapy so if the patient scores only two points then the risk benefit ratio uh, regarding the thromboembolism and the chronic use of anticoagulants always should be taken so this is another very important thing about atrial fibrillation if you get a uh, you know uh, the in the exam and you may be you may have to remember about charts was scoring again so again uh, the other thing is about the premature atrial contractions so again you know the you should always if you are going in uh, uh, systematically if you are looking for the p waves in premature atrial contractions p wave will be there because you know the other than the sa node this particular impulse has originated in the atria other than the sa node that is why because it has originated in a, in a you know a place other than the sa node so the conduction or depolarization of the atria is abnormal that is why you have an abnormal p wave so you have an abnormal p wave and also the qrs complex will be early so that you know between the normal the previous r wave and then the next you know um, the r wave that is produced as a result of the pre premature atrial contraction it will be narrow but you know one thing because this impulse has been originated in the atria itself that is why this impulse also goes to the sa node and also it presets the it so depolarizes the sa node and presets the sa node so that's why sa node thinks that it has just you know uh, given an impulse so the next impulse it gives regular pp interval it will give so the rr interval so from the ectopic to the next r will be the nor normal rr interval so many times we will always be talking about the compensatory pause whether it is complete or incomplete so here the compensatory pause will be incomplete why what is this compensatory pause you measure the normal rr interval between two rrs now you also measure the rr interval between the previous r previous to the ectopic and the next r so suppose this rr interval in between is the qrs complex is twice the rr interval then we say compensatory pause is complete now here it is incomplete because sa node gets preset because of the sa node depolarization by this ectopic uh, uh, impulse so one thing about premature atrial contractions that usually benign you need not have to do anything so many times it can be in uh, copd patients or bronchial asthma patients and also it can be due to some amount of uh, hypoxia so you just correct the cause usually they'll disappear now coming to the ventricular premature contractions so ventricular premature contractions are usually pathologic they are not uh, you know um, benign and the usually the rate will be less than 100 so if there is a ventricular a uh, premature contraction so you how do we diagnose so usually the uh, p wave will be absent so because you know the the particular impulse is being originated in the ventricle so naturally this um, impulse cannot cross the av junction and go to the atria and then depolarize the atria so that is the reason you don't have a p wave in ventricular premature contraction and this again impulse is not conducted through the normal bundle of his and then the parkinje system so it will be taking a more time that is why the ventricular premature contraction will always the qrs complex will be wide so 
white QRS complex with absent P wave, you can always say, and the P wave is always opposite to the QRS complex, is a premature ventricular contraction. So when we have to treat this, uh, if we are uh, seeing a premature or VPCs on the monitor, uh, or if the patient has uh, come to us for prenatal evaluation, he is having this VPCs. When to treat these VPCs are is very very important. So the um, other thing about the, I was talking to you about the compensatory pause. Let me just discuss about the compensatory pause, and then let me talk to you about when these VPCs have to be treated. Now here, as I told you that this premature ventricular contraction is from an impulse that is originated in the ventricle and it cannot reset the P wave. So the next QRS complex will take slightly longer time to appear. So if you are seeing the measuring the normal RR interval and the R wave previous to the disectopic and the next normal R wave, the distance between these two R waves will be twice the RR interval uh, very commonly. And this is called as the compensatory pause is complete. Okay, now compensatory pause is complete in uh, VPCs, whereas incomplete, incomplete in uh, APCs. And P wave will be present but abnormal in APCs. P wave will be absent in VPCs. And again, the QRS complex will be normal in APC. QRS complex is white and bizarre in VPC. So these are, these are some of the differences you have to know to differentiate between an APC and a VPC. So when to treat? So when VPCs are multiple in number, so when they are more than six in number, so you should treat them. So when they are multifocal in origin, here you can see, you know, the morphology of uh, VPCs are differing from one B to the other, one VPC to the other. That means they are arising from multiple foci. That is called as a multifocal in origin. And when there is a bigemini or a trigemini, that means a normal beat, an ectopic. Even in the first uh, graph you are seeing, a bigemini is there, a normal beat is there, and a ventricular ectopic. Suppose if two normal beats are there, a third beat is a ventricular ectopic, it is called as a trigemini. So when they are multiple in number, multifocal in origin, uh, when there is bigemini and trigemini, and you know when runs of ventricular premature contractions are occurring, that means there are more than three continuous ventricular con premature contractions are occurring, occurring as if it is a ventricular tachycardia, then also the required treatment. And when the ventricular premature contraction is falling on the T wave, the previous T wave, that means it is falling on the relative refractory period and that can initiate a ventricular fibrillation or a ventricular tachycardia. So that is called as R on T phenomenon. So these are the conditions wherein you have to treat multiple, multifocal, bigemini, trigemini, R on T phenomenon, and then runs of more than three mimicking ventricular tachycardia. So how do we treat? So the most common drug that usually is given for treating this ventricular premature contractions is you know lidocaine so lidocaine usually you give whenever you require you think that the uh, you know these uh, vpcs are to be treated you give a bolus dose to reach the therapeutic concentration of uh, 3 to 4 you know micrograms per uh, ml that is usually you give 1 to 1.5 milligram per kg body weight and then what you do is then you start giving an infusion of uh, lidocaine, 60 micrograms per kg per minute for first 20 minutes, then for two hours, 30 micrograms per kg per minute, and then later, 15 micrograms per kg per minute infusion. You have to treat these uh, patients with dangerous VPCs. Coming to the monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So, you know, monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is, uh, you know, all the uh, ventricular complexes are wide and uh, bizarre, and uh, they are regular. Uh, in um, their uh, rhythm and also you can see that all the complexes are of the same configuration so and the rate is very high the rate can be as high as 100 to 250 we call it as a monomorphic vent vt or ventricular tachycardia and again you have to look for whenever there is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia is there so you have to see whether the patient is stable or unstable the patient is stable then definitely you can give amiodarone and you know it can be given 150 to 300 milligrams bolus over 10 minutes and then followed by one milligram per minute for six hours and 0.5 milligram per minute later or if the patient is unstable hemodynamically better to go for cardioversion with maximum dose 200 joules of 
biphasic uh, you know um, current then coming to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or some um, many times it can be tacitity pointers also so again you know the multiple foci the origin is uh, from this polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and also you can see the configuration of each of these impulse will be different there are wide and bizarre and you know in tacitity point is it appears like twisting around a central axis so this kind of polymorphic ventricular especially tacitity point is common in patients with a blown QT interval and you know, if this occurs, if the patient is stable, definitely respond to magnesium. So 2 grams of magnesium can be given over 10 minutes for this. So the patient can be reverted to the regular rhythm. So if it is unstable, go for electrical defibrillation. Then ventricular fibrillation this is another uh, common ECG that is kept. So, you know, quite bizarre, you know, you can't even make out what is the kind of rhythm and then uh, the you know the waves so this is very rapid and the patient invariably in the will be arrested so if such is this case so you have to manage by cpr and you have to defibrillate the patient so you follow the guidelines of uh, you know uh, bls and acls and the next class will be on uh, this acls then uh, this will be dealt in detail so again coming to the bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias so sinus bradycardia Again, you know, if the in adult patient, if it is less than 60 beats per minute, it is called as sinus bradycardia. And there are many causes for uh, these uh, sinus bradycardia. It can be physiological in athletes, it can be low. And many other drugs, um, like, you know, um, which can increase the vagal tone, like this dialysis and proponium, beta blockers, also can produce this uh, bradycardia, sinus bradycardia. Most important for us is halothane and succinylcholine, especially the succinylcholine when repeat dose, because repeat dose will produce an accumulation of succinyl monocholine, which acts on the SNO to produce sinus bradycardia. So usually the sinus bradycardia may not require uh, you know, treatment unless it is too low and also it is affecting the cardiac output, then the best drug, drug of choice is you know, the atropine. Coming to the first degree AV block. So uh, usually, there will be a prolongation of the um, you know, PR interval. If it is more than 0.2, you call it as a first degree AV block. There are many conditions causes which can produce first degree AV block. Usually, you need not have to do anything for first degree AV block. But if there is a second degree AV block, so there are two types of second degree AV block, Mobitz type 1 and type 2. In Mobitz type 1, it is also called as a Wenke block, the Wenke block uh, phenomenon where there is a gradual prolongation of the PR interval and suddenly there is a missing of the QRS complex. Whereas in uh, type 2 mobits, usually you know, the uh, PR interval will be normal, but there is a regularly or irregularly, there is a missing of the QRS complex. So if the patient has got a second degree AV block, and if the patient is symptomatic with you know, um, vasovagal attacks, syncopal attacks, so definitely these patients require uh, maybe uh, you know, preoperatively, they may require a permanent pacemaker or intraoperatively, you have to keep a, um, uh, you know, transcutaneous pacemaker because these patients may go in for a complete heart block intraoperatively. Then coming to the complete heart block, where is, there is a complete dissociation between the atria and ventricle, the AV block, AV node is completely blocked. So, uh, you know, the atria are uh, getting depolarized by themselves, ventricles are depolarizing by themselves. <laughs> So you can see the P waves separately and then the QRS complex separately. There is no relationship between the PR, P waves and the QRS complex. And the ventricular rate can be very low. So again, this has got two types, acquired and you know, congenital. Acquired, usually very low, 45 beats or even less than 45 beats. Invariably, these patients will have a low cardiac output state and these patients require a preoperative pacemaker. So if this particular... Um, you know, ECG is given, you have to say that these patients do require pacemaker before taking up for surgery. And if this occurs intraoperatively, like a second degree a AV node can get converted to complete heart block, you require a transcutaneous pacing of the heart. So again, pacemaker ECG can be kept, especially, uh, you know, when in a patient with pacemaker, uh, in a patient with complete heart block, you may say that uh, patient may be on pacemaker, so you may be given a pacemaker ECG, you always look for the spikes here. So it can be an atrial 
facing. So if the, the spike is coming before the P wave, it is an atrial being faced. And if a you know spike is coming um, just before the QRS complex and QRS complex is wide, it is ventricle is being faced. And you know the spikes are there before the P wave and then the QRS complex. It's both atria and ventricle are being faced. So there can be a lot of questions on pacemaker and anesthesia. So coming to the bundle branch blocks, you have two types of bundle branch blocks. You have an RBBB and an LBBB. In RBBB uh, and LBBB, you just have to look at the QRS complex. So if the QRS complex is wide, and it can be either RBBB or LBBB. So when a wide QRS complex is there, you just look at the V1 and V2 leads, just leads. So if in the V1 and V2, if there are tall R waves, and it can be even M type, there is R dash R pattern of uh, you know the waves. So tall R waves in V1 and V2 and S waves in V5 and V6, that is an right bundle branch block. So this can be a normal variant, even if it is there in the patient, you need not have to do. But if it occurs fresh, then it can be a sign of ischemic heart disease. So LBBB is always pathological, the left bundle, because you know it is the one which is uh, you know stimulating or depolarizing the left ventricle. And this again, you can easily diagnose. So if there is a widened QRS complex with no positive R waves in V1, then you and V2, so now you know that it is a LBBB. So LBBB may be because of degenerative changes or myocardial ischemia. So coming to the WPW syndrome, already I have spoken to you about WPW syndrome, but this also ECG can be kept. If there is a short PR interval with a delta hump, you know that it is Wolf Parkinson, Parkinson White syndrome. So most important anesthetic importance is, you know, you should be very careful in using anticholinergics and symptomatic agents in this. So hypertrophy is yes, again right ventricular hypertrophy. You just see the V1. If the RS ratio is more than one in V1, you can say, and there is no widening of the QRS, you say it is a right ventricular hypertrophy. And left ventricular hypertrophy, you just see the depth of the S wave in V1 and also the amplitude of uh, R wave in V5. You just join these. If they are more than 35, you can diagnose it as a left ventricular hypertrophy, which may be because of an after increased afterload or because of the increase in preload, it can be a concentric hypertrophy or eccentric hypertrophy. Again, myocardial ischemia and infarctions. I'm not going to details about these things. These ECGs can be given. You look at the STT wave changes and you know where exactly which lead these STT wave changes, and especially the ST elevation has occurred. And if the ST elevation is there in lead two, three, and AVF, you know that it's an inferior wall infarction. And if it is there in lead one AVL and V1, V2, V3, it is anteroceptal infarction. If it is there in uh, lead one, then AVL and then V3, V4, V5, V6, it is anteroceptal infarction. So this is what you have to look for. Look also for whenever there is infarction, is there two waves are also there or not. So and also look for ST depressions and T wave inversions that will give you in the same leads that will give you an idea about the ischemias. Then electrolyte imbalances can be asked for you. So usually the tall peak T waves are the first thing about hyperkalemia. So you can see here, once it reaches six already, you know, peaking of the T wave can be there. As it goes up, the PR interval gets prolonged. The amplitude of the R wave will start coming down. And finally, uh, it can go for a sine wave pattern and can lead to ventricular fibrillation arrest. So dextrocardia is another ECG can be kept. You just look at the uh, lead one. In lead one, you always see a positive P wave and you will never see a um, you know, negative P wave in routine D. But if in dextrocardia, there can be a negative or uh, negative P wave in lead one. And also look at the AVR. I told you that AVR always say QS complexes will be there. And if a positive R wave is there with a P wave, you know, negative P wave in the lead one, you can diagnose dextrocardia. Then the axis, normal axis is minus 32 uh, plus uh, 110. So I'm not going to details about the axis because it will take a long time to go into the axis. So usually, um, you know, you just see the, uh, you know, uh, the um, ABF and then the lead one. So ABF is, you know, vertical like this and uh, lead one is horizontal. They are perpendicular to each other. 
just look at the abf and the lead one and if there, there is a positive r wave in v1 and positive r wave in abf it is a normal axis if the there is a negative wave in lead one the positive wave in abf if they are looking at each other is a right axis deviation so the axis will be more than plus 110 and if they are opposite to each other then it is a left axis deviation and the axis can be more than minus 30 so some of the things like bifacicular block also is important to know if there is an rbbb with a left atrial left axis deviation because whenever there is rbbb is there there has to be a right axis deviation but if there is a left axis deviation there can be a left anterior hemi block it is called as a bifacicular block if it is associated with first degree hemi block it is called as a trifacicular block this is very important because these are the patients who can go for very operative complete heart block now just take home message so always read the ecg systematically look for standardization rate and rhythm very important morphology of p wave first always look for then the pr interval then is there any significant q wave is there and qrs complex width you always look for is the widening hypertrophy also you look for um, you know ventricular hypertrophy is and again st segment just look for any myocardial ischemia p wave inversions are there and any depressed st segment and again qt interval again very important to you know every patient every vcg when it is given look for these things so this is in a nutshell about the ecgs for the exam purpose i have not gone into detail but already i have completed about nearly i think 50 minutes so thank you for patient listening